Hello and welcome to our new series, I Formulate Revisited. My name is David Calvert and just over seven years ago, together with Jim Bullock, we formed I Formulate Limited. Since then, we've made many conference presentations and we thought that due to that and the rather strange times we live in at present in 2020, it may be a good idea to look back and reflect on some of our presentations and consider if the comments we made then are still valid. In this video, we go back to a presentation I made in London in April 2013 at a conference entitled Driving Open Innovation in Food and Drink and Nutraceuticals. And this was organized by UBM. The two day conference was, as the title would suggest, targeted at looking for processes to drive open innovation in the food and drink sector. Companies who presented included GSK, Unilever, Coca-Cola and Tate and Lyle. So that was quite an impressive list of large companies who spoke about their experience in introducing open innovation into their organisations. Other speakers discussed scouting and the use of social media, still at quite an early stage at that stage, in embedding open innovation in a company's culture. I spoke on the second day to the title of Collaborative Innovation OI in practice. And before I move on to the actual presentation, I want to show you how our marketing has evolved over the last seven years by presenting this title slide in the template I used at the time. Now I do warn you, if you have the chance, then please put on some sunglasses now. So here you go. This was an attempt to make the slide stand out. And I think you would agree that it does that. But now you can relax and we'll go back to the presentation revisited with our now standard, cleaner and much more reserved template. So this is the standard background to I formulate that we were using at that time. And to be fair, it's similar to ones that we use today. We were formed, as I said, in 2012 and our experience has not changed except that in the intervening time we've worked with many, many more clients, both large and small, and in countries all around the world. Our service offer continues to offer companies help with new ideas and technologies and building projects. Our main business, though, is most certainly in consultancy, and the majority of this work is under non-disclosure agreements. NDAs as they are known, so we are unable to go into details about the specifics. Whilst we can and continue to talk about our training offer, in this presentation we looked at some work we've done around cross-industry translational activities in something that we called Open Innovation Roadshows. So although the majority of the audience came from companies involved in formulation, they were almost exclusively from the food and drink sector. And as we were looking to emphasize how you would learn from other industries, we used this slide to bring in other sectors that we felt they should consider. Whilst the high tech sectors such as pharma and cosmetics may have been considered by the audience as being closer to them, the dirtier industries such as detergents, cleaners, paints, adhesives, sealants and lubricants may have been regarded as so low tech that they had nothing to offer the audience, but we wanted to discourage that impression. So, to bring out the similarities, we looked at the formats used across all these industries. Solid formats such as tablets, granules and powders to other multi-phase formats such as emulsions, suspensions, creams and lotions. Many could have thought that these last few were simply liquids, but as all formulators know, the structure and multi-phase aspect of these formats is absolutely critical to their success. And why do companies actually formulate? What is the point, you might say? And, and again, we wanted to bring across that these things are common across almost all industries. Everybody wants to claim that their product performs and they want to make in some areas specific claims. They need to make them available in the application. They might need to formulate to meet a quality standard and almost certainly they need to make sure that their product is stable. 
no industry can forget about cost and it doesn't matter what you formulate you must be able to make it and make it at the right price and of course there are regulatory requirements which go across almost every single industry and we brought this out to the audience so as well as those requirements and the reasons for formulation what other things do they have in common and I think it's fair to say that almost every formulated product has multiple ingredients, at least two, and, and in many cases, many more. And there are multiple phases, even if people look at them and think it's a liquid, it's not the case. Um, a complex microstructure is common to many um, formulations and they use particles. They all use droplets in some form at times and, and everything has a surface and an interface. And in many industries, it's quite important, maybe for stability, maybe for delivery to encapsulate. But let's not forget when you encapsulate, you need to then release and deliver. So there are many things that formulated products have got in common when you look at them in some detail. So formulation is an enabling tool, it's often said in many industries. Um, but sometimes they act in isolation and certainly in, in lots of different markets, people act in isolation. They think they know everything about their product and they may well know an awful lot. But could they learn from other people and could their problem shared with people who are maybe um, not as close to their industry? Could that problem be enlightened by somebody else's view? And it was certainly our um, intention during this presentation to bring that across. So before we move on to showing how you can actually share problems, let's just look at what formulators do and what formulate what problems formulation can solve. In many cases it can help to look for the active substance and make it more soluble or more bioavailable stabilizing an active substance and an active substance is there in every single industry uh, and preventing that active substance from either degrading be that chemically or physically is also extremely important during its product storage or in use getting it where it needs to be improving its delivery at the right time is extremely important and how it's released is extremely important when and where is it released it's not just a matter of releasing it but you've got to release it at the right time in the right place and of course we've spoken about formulation being composed of multiple ingredients so you really need to make them all compatible or else you get issues with stability that we've just talked about I wanted to bring across to the audience who are in food and drink that actually taste is not just their issue but also in pharmaceutical formulations and how important that can be to ensure compliance particularly when children are taking tablets or taking medications and you want to mask the taste or give it an alternative taste and of course you need to uh, often formulations have trouble with UV stability and pharma formulations often need photo stabilization but that problem is not unique to pharmaceuticals anything where you have uh, exposure to UV light can cause those things to become unstable so we wanted to show that there are lots of reasons why people might formulate and many of them are multiple reasons and those reasons apply across lots of different industries So now I wanted really to look at a, a very specific example and one of the things when you look back is you say well what have we used in terms of references and and this reference here talking about liposomes and how they're used in drug delivery um, this doesn't exist anymore so if you follow that link I'm afraid you're not going to find it but similarly if you search for liposomes on Wikipedia you'll find an example and, and an explanation of what they are in there they're fairly simple they use phospholipid structures and apologies to those who work with this and think they're not simple but in, in when you look at them and explain them they are they have a hydrophilic head and a hydrophobic tail when you put them into water they start to form a bilayer and then they form a liposome when you shake them with water and the great things about these types of structures is that you can trap both hydrophobic and hydrophilic substances within that structure so it's a way of encapsulating that 
And this technology is being used and, and Yvonne Perry has done a number of reviews and you can look her up and look up some of her papers. And, and phospholipids are, uh, based liposomes can be used for oral vaccine delivery and how appropriate that seems in times like these. So that's okay, you've encapsulated, but what does that really mean? Well, those phospholipids allow you to actually get your payload across the cell membrane. So when they actually come in, as you can see on the left-hand side of this, of this slide, they actually then release their payload and those substances and the vaccines, in the case of some of the papers we've done, are actually delivered across that barrier. And again, you may think, well, that's just pharmaceuticals, but what about cosmetics? What about delivering things across barriers in uh, agrochemicals, for example? There are barriers on a leaf, there are barriers within an insect. So those things are quite important if you start to think outside of the box. So we spoke about um, maybe some of the, I guess, dirtier industries not being of interest to the rather sophisticated pharmaceutical or even food and drink industries. But um, here's an example of, I guess, a really dirty industry in terms of the, the laundry uh, industry and some work that was done there in terms of how you can control the release and have a core shell encapsulation. So here, uh, and it came from Addison Care Briggs Arms and York, who were, uh, that's a combination of P&G and the University of Leeds, they, they showed how you can get block copolymer micelles encapsulating and releasing hydrophobic materials. And these could therefore be incorporated into laundry products to actually release different actives to either maybe prevent the release of uh, the um, dirt being put onto fabrics or to actually to, to help maybe even with odour, etc. So an interesting example of, of how you can use cost shell and controlled release in, in industries that you might think are a little bit too simple. And then we go on to extremely complex ones. So this is an interesting example that we, we've used quite a lot where you can produce drop by drop extremely complex particles. So if you look at the top diagram, you have an inner phase and each drop then is encapsulated in what they've called here the middle phase. And then you can have another phase, the outer phase as they're calling it, which then is also encapsulated and you're trying to seal each one. And you may think, and the lovely diagram here on the left hand side of the types of structures you can produce, and you may think, well, this is all fine, it's an academic exercise, but there is a Capsum who've actually produced products which have a hydrophobic active encapsulated in a copolymer, and they've got, they've got commercial products there. So a very, very sophisticated example of something that allows you to get multiple phases and multiple ingredients protected and then delivered. And this is one of my favorite examples. Everybody talks about water and they get wet in water. And this one comes from uh, Bernie Binks at the University of Hull. And he is one of the pioneers, talks about dry water. And in this case, you have water, as you can see in the particle here, surrounded by hydrophobic silica particles. And what that means, and it's 95% water, think of the sphere, but then with a large sphere of water or a droplet of water with lots of smaller silica particles. So by weight, 95% water and only 5% silica. But that is actually then dry, as you can see on the picture here. And where's that useful? Well, when it's pressed, then you get the water released so you can have moisturizing work in terms of cosmetics. So again, formulation is not just simply mixing things together. It's how you do that. What is the structure that you form? So having convinced those in the audience and hopefully those listening now that formulation was quite a clever thing. Um, how about how could those ideas be translated across the industries? And, and at the conference, we'd actually heard an awful lot about how open innovation was a growing trend and since then has continued in many ways um, in lots of different areas. And, and the objective of that is obviously to make use of ideas, expertise and technologies from outside of your own organisation. And in many of the presentation, we heard about what those benefits are. There were more ideas and there were better ideas, 
the development was faster and there was an element of risk sharing. And this diagram here on the right, for those of you, this is after Chesborough was one of the pioneers of open innovation, talked about a funnel and he talked about how you brought in internal and external ideas into that funnel. You then fed various things in and, and in that funnel you might have some leakages, but they might be positive leakages. You might have ventures, you might have spin outs, you might be able to license. And then coming out of the funnel, not only might you have a better product, but you might have a product for a different market. You might have a product in the other firm's market. So there are lots of options. You just needed to be open with your thoughts and to embrace a process of open innovation. And there are many different ways of doing that. But what could go wrong? Well, there's often concerns and in intellectual property and secrecy and how open can you be in these times where ideas can be taken away and particularly with large companies, it becomes quite difficult um, with lots of different lawyers talking about what different terms they want. And that can be a big stumbling block at the beginning. Also with open innovation, you see that large companies might have an idea of what they want, but there can be a little bit of a disparity in terms of the size of companies, uh, their objectives and the approach of the different partners when they're trying to work together. So normally, and, and the model that is still fairly common is there's a large multinational looking for new technologies from small technology providers. Now to those small technology providers, this is their means of surviving. This is everything for them, but for the multinational and where it can go wrong is it might just be an interesting project. They might not devote the resource. They certainly may not necessarily do it at the speed that a small company expects. And that of course can be vice versa. The small company can expect too much of the large company and not understand how they operate. And of course we talked about IP and secrecy and, and there's a certain need to definitely build trust when you're doing open innovation. So how, how can you avoid the pitfalls of open innovation? And in many ways, you've got to try and share the challenge. You've got to do equal contributions that relate to equal benefit and you need to try and do equal risk. And we found that it was very useful if you had non-competing industries. So that took away some of the competition elements, but try and look for common challenges. And if they're non-competing, then there's not necessarily interest in IP outside of each company's own sphere. And it's quite important therefore just to lay down some clear ground rules. And obviously one of those being that you're not going to step maybe onto the other person's turf. And it's, if we go back again to trust and it, it's so important and in our experience, it's been so important that you build time for trust to be developed. And that can be in open innovation, but that can be in everything really. You need to develop trust when you're working with partners and uh, many people forget to actually uh, build that time in. So let's talk about how we made our specific open innovation initiative happen. So they were a series of workshops and they were invitation only. So each company decided upon who they were going to invite to the workshop. We had four companies participating in this open innovation roadshow and they were all multinationals um, and they were very strong with a great depth of knowledge in science and engineering in their own field. Um, whilst we used larger companies, this could work with smaller companies. We just feel that the initiative is important that there's some equality there. So um, three large companies working with a small company, for example, might not really work. So similar size we feel would make this happen and make this uh, come to some real value for the participants. And in our particular one, the, the uh, different industries they came from were food, pharmaceuticals, crop protection, and home and personal care. So what actually was the format of each of these four workshops? Well, it took a while to get this sorted out, but um, one of the issues we mentioned earlier on was, was NDAs and IP. So we decided to use what is called the Chatham House Rules. 
and, and you could see on the right hand side and I think it's worth me reading this out. So when a meeting or part thereof is held under the Chatham House rule, participants are free to use the information received, but neither the identity nor the affiliation of the speakers nor that of any other participant may be revealed. So say what you wish, but just know about the restrictions. So you could you could talk about that, you can act upon that, but you shouldn't reveal who said it. In the roadshow, each company, each of the four companies acts as a host in turn, and they invited other companies, attendees from those four other companies to come to their site. The host would set a series of technical challenges, which we worked with them to um, develop a brief, and those were relevant to their businesses, and they were shared with the other participants. Uh, we normally started with a, a, a um, keynote speaker, but then we broke up into group sessions to try and um, exchange the experience and the idea, and then to invite ideas from the other participants and when we facilitated those small group sessions and the objective of each of the group sessions was to develop some areas of common interest for collaboration and hopefully move each of the, move the host companies forward with each of those ideas but it's worth saying it wasn't just a technical exchange we um, encouraged and it did actually happen that there was a dinner for the attendees the night before so again this allowed people to understand who was going to be there the next day learn a little bit more about them and to develop obviously some networking as i mentioned previously we had normally a keynote presentation from the host side each time who'd set the scene be that around their business be that around open innovation be that around some of the challenges, but to try and give the bigger picture before we delve straight into the individual issues. The idea was to, to build the bigger picture and what was the context for some of these challenges. Because don't forget, they came from different industries and might not understand what the issues were in each of those. And we also built in the opportunities for people to look around the labs or to visit the site. And as everybody will know, when you visit another company, sometimes you learn an awful lot from just from looking around. So sometimes those tours took place before the uh, actual workshops, sometimes halfway through, sometimes at the end. But it always gave them a chance. And once again, you are getting an opportunity to network and learn a little bit more about the business and put some of the challenges into context. So what came out at the end of it all? Well. Everybody who attended was um, very impressed and came away invigorated. Some people attended more than one workshop, but we had 108 attendances at four workshops. And it was over 11 months. You couldn't rush these things. We needed to reflect each time we held a, a, a roadshow visit. We actually reflected on what worked and what didn't work. And then obviously for the second one, that became more important. It's worth pointing out again that it wasn't just R&D scientists and engineers. They were the main participants, but there were also people uh, attending from the commercial, the supply chain, manufacturing, and there were some open innovation practitioners from the large companies. And again, that's really to emphasize that open innovation, if it's truly open, is not just an R&D activity, but it needs to be a cross company activity as well as being an external coming in activity. Over the four um, roadshows, we worked on 15 different company challenges. Um, some were very relevant to formulation across all sectors, stabilization, microstructure, delivery, formulation processing, not forgetting that processing and manufacturing is also a formulation step. And some about end user experience, which was interesting, again, coming from different industries, how do they interact with their end user and how can that be applied to their industry there were lots of experience sharing obviously and contacts were shared it wasn't compulsory that people handed over details but there were lots and lots of business cards being exchanged not just solving problems but also generating new ideas and new problems perhaps that they could work on together and all of the road shows were documented well and we suggested a number of follow-up options that the companies could work on. 
much more concrete than just the ideas. There were six concrete project areas for potential collaborative projects and they were worked up. Well, I mean, there were just loads of conversations one on one. There were then we, we knew that there were lots of offline meetings took place because, again, in the space of an, an, an a small little group session might only last about 45 minutes. But the sparking of the ideas led to a number of offline meetings between the participant companies and they were companies that would never necessarily get together. And uh, at that stage, there was a provisional plan to repeat as a concentrated annual event. So not four, but maybe a, a type of a, uh, a conference of the four. Uh, and then there was also an opportunity to bring in some additional companies. What did we observe and, and were there any surprises? Well, Certainly, if you were to participate in something like this, and if you want to do open innovation, you need to be committed. And, and specifically, we found that each company needed a named leader. So they needed somebody. This was not part of necessarily anybody's day job, but they needed to drive it within their companies and be a champion for the roadshow within the companies to get some buy in from functions and from people. Uh, as I said, we worked carefully with our participants before each roadshow event to try and select topics that where we thought there could be some good input from the other companies um, and where there could be some real value for the host company. It was seen as being highly effective and very cost effective by the participant companies and we were definitely impressed by the degree of openness that all the companies demonstrated and there was a, a remarkable amount of trust and uh, the ideas and the thoughts were there was no holding back in many ways on the ideas. The technical exchange for some of the specialists and, and we knew these companies very well was 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 to be expected. Um, we knew that they would be intrigued in other companies problems. That was part of their nature. Um, but what did surprises perhaps was that how companies were able to use it as a, a development process for less experienced and for new employees to try and give them the benefit of this open attitude right at the beginning of their careers uh, and actually surprisingly within the companies there were uh, there were new contacts made so uh, those silos that were built up potentially in a company were broken down by the roadshow and they started oh i didn't want to comment i didn't realize you did that Oh, we have that type of an issue just within the company, let alone with the other companies. The discussions we found were much more wide ranging than we expected. They weren't just technical, as we mentioned. They were the customer experience and, and how do you deal with customer experience, customer feedback. Regulations came into it, manufacturing, supply chain, as well as what we expected in terms of R&D. So we ended our uh, talk at the Open Innovation Roadshow about how people could benefit from something similar. And it's very, the benefits are very similar to open innovation in general. It brings in new ideas and technologies to your businesses. Um, some of the problems you've just not been able to move forward with, it can help to solve them and did. It could build collaborative projects and, and the phrase a problem shared is a quite a useful one and, and it starts to get you to get new people you get very fresh insights people who haven't got baggage uh, the phrase of seeing wood for the trees comes to mind but they they you could get definitely fresh insight from other industries who haven't got any ideas about we've done that before and it won't work it built some corporate but it also built those personal networks and the phrase phone a friend uh, is very relevant in this respect and and the number of um I suppose LinkedIn or any type of personal networks uh, became quite uh, significant, I should say. So as you would expect at the end of a presentation at a conference, we, we then want to see if we can get involved with the companies. And, and we said we were canvassing company interests for a second round of open innovation roadshows. This could have been a completely new set of companies or the participants from the first round were still keen to have it continue. As we mentioned, it's better to, best to have parity. So we thought about smaller companies as a consortium and it isn't an open innovation is never restricted to any tightly defined topic. It could move outside of formulation um, depending upon the specific company needs. 
This is revisited. So have we done a, a road show in the exact same format? No, we haven't. Have we run open innovation workshops? Yes, we have. And when we move on to the next slide, I would say that everything we do really is open innovation in that we try to look to help companies by solving their problems, by using our experience in different industries. So this would really explain a little bit about iFormulate worked then and works now. And technology scouting is actually open innovation in practice. They look for new ideas for the development program. They want to look at pros and cons of technologies and who they should talk to. And those technologies might not necessarily have been developed for their specific industry. Problem solving assignments. And, and they might have a simple problem. In inverted commas, simple. There's never anything as a simple formulation problem. But the solution to that may come from what people have done in other industries or ingredients or techniques that they've used. Or it may well be to start from scratch. And we've also done open training in formulation and a lot of custom in-house training designed for the clients. Um, where we try to bring experience from all different industries together to try to help people to work on their formulation science problems. At the end of the conference presentation, we gave some conclusions and, and this applies and did apply and does apply and will always apply. There will be other industries and applications that are facing the same challenges. If you understand their challenges and you look at their approaches and solutions, you'll make a lot of progress. Formulation does stretch across there and has a universal language. Sometimes it uh, confuses other people, but a formulator will talk about colloids, particles, dispersions, emulsions, encapsulation. And everybody has to make something and formulation, the way you make that formulation is the same across lots of different industries. And you do need to adapt and perfect and Think about, and we'd be happy to talk to you about an open innovation roadshow option, or just think about open innovation. Think about a different way of solving your problems. If it's really intractable, there is probably some other way of approaching that, that you could benefit from the way of thinking that you have in open innovation. So our play on words has got no better over the seven years, but we, we had a quick plug for forthcoming courses we were doing. We ran a course on solid state stability, looking at the science and new approaches for rapid determination in 2013. And we also looked at formulating nanoparticles as part of the nano formulation conference. If you're interested in um, any other training, just look on our website. We have a list of training courses we've run in the past and training courses that once we're through um, this virus issue, then we will be running more and more training courses. And as I said, we can actually uh, tailor those courses to your own specific needs. So I hope you've enjoyed this I Formulate Revisited presentation going back to 2013. Um, our contact details are there on the slide. If there are any issues out of this presentation or any other formulation science issues where you think we may be able to help us help you, then please do get in touch with either myself or Jim or look on our website if you want to learn more. That's www.iformulate.biz. We have a Twitter handle at iFormulate and we also have a LinkedIn group. So once again, thank you for listening. Hope it's brought you some benefit and look forward to speaking to you at another iFormulate revisited presentation in the very near future. Thank you very much and goodbye.